Hi, it's Charlene again here um, with Call on the Midwife. And I promised you last time, these are the little reference cards that we give out at our classes. And I promised you last time that I would go over this with you. Okay, and then I'm also, if we have time after this, <laughs> and it doesn't take too long, I'm going to go over some different emergencies and how to deal with them. Okay, just ones that I've got a list here of ones that are common. I hope you're well today. It's um, a beautiful sunny day outside. It's so beautiful and um, I'm just feeling really happy today with the weather. It's, it's just really nice. I'm going to go for a nice walk at the river today. I hope you're having fun getting out. Um, I have the most gorgeous plantain plant in my yard. I would like to try to bring you out there and show it to you today. I'm not sure how that'll work, but if we can, I'm going to bring you out because I found it just since I've recorded this. So fun because it's my own land. I have actually found two amazing plants on my own land just recently. One is the wild lettuce, which is an analgesic. And it's literally everywhere. <laughs> so you just pick the leaves, you dry them, and then store them, and then you can make tea. Um, if a person's really ill, they can smoke it. Um, you know, like cannabis. It's very, very potent, but it is good for, you know, having in your storage in times to come when we won't necessarily have access to pharmaceutical drugs or hospitals or anything that has analgesic effects and there'll probably be need for it. So I'm happy I found that wild prickly lettuce plant and I'm collecting the seeds right now for that and the leaves. And then you can also collect the milk. There's like a milk in it and you can you can cook it down. You can do different things. Um, and then, uh, but the plantain, I'm super excited. I mean, these leaves are literally this big and it's, it's a major, major sized um, plant that I have. So anyway, I'm excited. Um, and so maybe I'll do just to, to do a little bit on the plants and stuff. Maybe I'll take you out and show you the plantain today just for fun. I hope you can see me. I'm trying to make sure I have better lighting so that you can see. But it is a little tricky. And with my right eye being so low, it, 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 I know it looks a bit funny, but I can't do anything about it. <laughs> ah, it is what it is. Okay. So this is the little handout, the little, so, sort of the little cheat sheet. It's almost like a little cheat sheet of our four hour low resource birth response class, okay? And it's called um, the Errand of Angels. So the first thing we say is invite the divine assistance of angels to guide you. Absolutely, absolutely. I can't, I can't um, emphasize that enough. I mean, I would say I operate as a spiritual midwife, so you know, most people who are watching this, hopefully you're okay with that because I talk about God and I talk about the angels and um, I've had so much amazing experiences myself with them that, I mean, I could never deny it as part of my experience, you know, and a really integral and very important part of my experience that makes me feel really safe and comfortable um, because I get guidance, you know, and um, I mean, sometimes the guidance, I just, something just popped into my head about guidance and that is, you know, I've even had guidance where somebody asked me to be at their birth, but I just was guided not to be there. And it, it's just kind of like, I really actually wanted to be, but I had to travel to go to this person's house. This was in Canada. But, <clears throat> you know, it turned out that birth, it turned it out that it was good that I wasn't there just because of the way things turned out that it was really really a difficult thing for all the people involved and I don't think it would have made a difference if I was there but it would have been a hard thing for me at that time in my life with my family and everything so I think really knowing how to listen to the spirit is critical for a midwife for a doula for um, just a lay person who's aware and awake right now that we're gonna need literally thousands of helpers I mean, it used to be there was somebody in every little area. Oh, yeah, let's go call on Mrs. Smith. You know, she'll come down with her bag and help have the baby. She knows what to do. 
And they did. I mean, it was like having a baby wasn't medicalized till just the last, you know, few hundred, couple, well, I don't know how many decades or hundreds of years, but it's really just decades, I think. Um, maybe in the 30s and 20s and stuff. It became hospitalized where um, instead of at home, people started having their babies in the hospital and then you started having all the drugs and all the interventions and all the really abuses and things that interfere with, it's like taking an animal. If you took like a cat or a dog who's trying to have her baby and started like putting her on a bed, shaving the front of her, I mean, she'd just, those cats would just go nuts. They wouldn't, they would be, they couldn't do it. You, you just, you would kill them <laughs> and their babies would probably, they'd probably eat them or something, you know? It's like, and we wonder why we have women who are depressed after they have their babies in exorbitant amounts of people who have that in our culture. Well, because we don't have systems that really empower women in birth. It, well, we do have some systems in place, but they're hard to find, they're hard to access in many places. In other places, more. Like, I'm from Seattle, and it's so much more accessible in midwifery. And it's so much more popular and so much more mainstream there. And here it's like, nobody, let's just go get drugged up. <laughs> you know, let's just go get drugged up and do what they tell us to do and lay there like a passive woman who has no say. I mean, it's, it's, it's barbaric really what we do. But anyway, okay. <laughs> um, I think we just need to learn that when we interfere like they do, in the hospital, typically on every birth I've seen there. I mean, there's a rare exception, but um, you're going to have problems and you're not going to be able to resolve them in the home setting. So yeah, we don't need to create problems that we can't resolve in an unexpected or a planned low resource birth. You can see the, the trees are moving. It's, it's just got, it's just a light breeze. It's so beautiful outside. Well, maybe we'll go out and look at the plantain. That'd be really fun. I hope you like that. All right. Well, let's let's move on here with our with our class for today or our, our lesson for today. All right. We'll start with um, a little quote that's at the very top. I don't know if you can see that, but it says, "Prayer casteth out all fear." And now the scripture really is perfect love casteth out all fear. That's the scripture. I've brought that up at births many times. You just say that to a woman, perfect love casteth out all fear. Just kind of helps her center ground. I actually had that experience with a VBAC mom. And she had had, oh no, she wasn't a VBAC mom, sorry. She had had like severe shoulder dystocias with like three of her babies. So the baby's heads were quite big but the shoulders were really large and she was quite tiny and it was just like she had home births but they had a difficult difficult time getting those babies out and this one time I don't feel like I should tell you this story <laughs> okay we're gonna tell a story um her name's Harriet I love her so much she's in Canada I know she won't mind me sharing this because she loves to have her experience be an empowering lesson for other women who are maybe a little discouraged. One thing that does happen is, you know, babies can get pretty big. And if a woman has a history of shoulder dystocia and, you know, she continues to have babies, sometimes they can actually get bigger and bigger, right? So this baby was 10 pounds easily you know, 10 something. And, um, you know, what we did was we just didn't rush it. We didn't rush in and try to do anything. When the head was coming out, it was just like, leave it alone. Let her, and she was in a really good upright supported squat position. And, um, right in that moment, she just looked at me and she said, oh, I need something like, I need something sharp, say a scripture or something. And she's not even really, I mean, she's definitely not a religious person, but extremely spiritual. One of, the, one of the most spiritual people I know, actually. Very, very spiritual. So I just 
the first thing that popped into my mind was perfect love casteth out all fear perfect love casteth out all fear and it was for me too it was for me it was for her husband it was for the baby and and you know what she didn't have a sting with shoulder just to show that baby just we just we knew we just we just kept this I can't tell you how much prayer intention positive thinking positive affirmations positive energy thought processes it, it fills the air and it affects the baby it affects the birth it affects the mother it affects the care providers it affects the hormonal cocktail that I talked about extremely affects the hormonal cocktail and it gives the woman faith you know and trust that there's a higher power here with us we're not alone and this is a really and you can feel it so you start getting really constant uh, confirmations through your physical form like you know however you feel your intuitive um, knowing and that can come through like for me it kind of buzzes down my feet and then buzzes around my chest and I sometimes get stuff around my ears you have to learn whatever it is for you it will be unique to you some people feel like just a warm kind of feeling like almost like a burning in their chest everyone's different how it affects you but we have to get out of our head and into our body to intuit because our bodies are the receptors the receptacles of the inspiration and the intuition okay so and but it will can come back into our minds like it did just now with that story but the point was that we didn't panic and even though she'd had a history of it, we didn't lay that on top of that birth. We let that birth be what it was. And even though we knew the baby was big, we also didn't say, oh, just because the baby's big, it's going to get stuck. No. That's like creating the negative experiences, overplaying the fear and projecting the fear onto them. Okay, so we have to not do that, not project fear. I'm just going to go through these points with you, okay? Number one, there's 13 points. I'm just going to read them all through without interruption, just so you can get a real sense of what this is. It's very, very simple. I mean, because we know this is just what people could remember, but this is a little really nice. It's kind of a, a nice thick little card that they can put in their birth kit so they can just kind of have a quick reminder of the real basics. All right, let's go over them now. You ready? <laughs> all right, let's do this. Trust God and the birth process birth is a natural process yes trust God and the birth process it is so true <laughs> it is it is not a medical process it is not a medical act you know like like we think of medical acts or medical um, processes but birth is just a natural process just like it's best at home really it really is i mean i'm just being blunt the truth is it is because women get affected by their surroundings and i mean of course if they feel safer in the hospital then that that changes that because you know however she perceives it is going to affect her so yeah sometimes if they have the right uh, group of people around them in the hospital they can feel really ins insulated from the you know from the interventions and stuff and if they have a really good doctor and a good hospital that's not too high up on their rules they they could have a decent experience and I know I've had some amazing experiences in the hospital myself actually truthfully with really empowered sovereign women who have done their homework and gotten their team around them of really amazing people especially good doula a good doula who's your advocate and knows her stuff okay trust God in the birth process birth is a natural process um, assign number two assign someone to remain constantly with the mother be calm and reassure the mother like I said in many of my films your energy your attitude and your calm energy so like one of the things that you can do initially we talked about this last time is pacing slowing down slowing your breath down taking longer uh, right away if you start deep breathing you'll you'll release any it'll help you release the anxiety the stress even if you're feeling really afraid because it could be that you've never been to a birth before and then suddenly you're there and you're 
the one. <laughs> so like I'm trying to prepare everyone that that could be the case. It would be nice if we had more midwives here, but you know, some people are actually taking training. And if you do want to take training, um, the school that I'm recommending right now is Mercy in Action. Um, and it's in Pocatello or Boise, Boise, Idaho. Um, I do recommend that school if you can. Um, there's other ones, but there's a lot that are highly academic and medical. And um, I think in what, what we're coming into right now, that's not as practical because you're not going to necessarily have all that stuff around. You need to learn to have, you know, Heart and Hands is my favorite book on midwifery by Elizabeth Davies. I highly recommend that book. We did a full study group on that book and it was excellent. Each of the people in the study group took a chapter and taught one of our circles from, and we went through all the chapters in that book by Elizabeth Davies, fifth edition. Excuse me, I recommend it. But that book is called Heart and Hands for a reason. <laughs> It's not about your head, and it's not about having a ton of knowledge. Knowledge is great, experience is good, but truthfully, understanding your role and not having such a high and mighty idea of what you're doing there. I mean, really, you're there, but this woman is doing it, and she can do it. Okay, so let's continue on our list so we can get through it. So assign someone to be with the mother constantly. Yes, that's actually research shows that that instantaneously increases the mother's um, outcome. Um, statistically, you know, it shows that if she has someone with her constantly through the whole labor, someone who's not going back and forth or, you know, trading off with someone else or whatever. That's why the doulas um, show, are shown to have an extremely um, great benefit. They lower interventions, they lower um, risks, and they increase good outcomes, okay? And they also increase the father and the mothers, um, the, the, you know, the couples, whatever that couple is, they, they increase the connection. Oh my goodness. Falcon. Huge falcon just went by my window. <laughs> it's good for the marriage, okay? That's a sign. That's always a confirmation when a falcon comes by. Says, yes, you know, the husbands are part of this. The, the, the men need to feel welcome and warm and loved and part of that energy. And so a doula can really also statistically make it so that the husband doesn't feel so much pressure, I think. He doesn't have to get every glass of juice or water or food. He doesn't have to take her to the bathroom every single time. He could maybe go to the bathroom while she's getting, dual is taking her. Do you know what I mean? So then he takes care of himself better and he's more um, able to be there emotionally. And that is what she needs from him, is the emotional loving connection from him. Kissing and hugging and touching. And sexual intimacy can really be good for labor. So we talked, I've talked about that a lot. Um, it's a great way to get labor going if, if, you know, if it's a stalled out labor or if things are just not, not moving the way they need to. Any kind of water, any kind of sensual, you know, sensual, like low lighting, nice relaxing music, nice kissing and talking and kind of, you know, someone kind of stroking your forehead or, like all those soft, gentle things that create oxytocin. I think sometimes even having an animal around, like if they really like their dog or something like that, and the dog kind of comes around, it can really bring the oxytocin levels up, which is really good. Okay, so place mother and attendant in a quiet, private area. Okay, so this is written so that if you're like, if you were in like a big, you know, hopefully you're not in a Walmart that's being used for corralling people oh dear yeah. <laughs> things are gonna get wild I think in this country and in Canada it's already happening I won't mention it but yeah my husband's up there right now he he said that the stuff that happened at the border when he crossed the border and the kind of paperwork they gave him it was like going into Nazi Germany the concentration camps they even have them on the list and they say this is where you'll have to go 
if you don't comply. It's really serious. Um, but I'm just, I think I'm a little distracted. I'll get back on track. <laughs> the point is that we need to be ready to help moms in out of hospital settings. So that's why I'm doing this. And I appreciate you liking my videos. I can't believe people la uh, like 45 people watch it and two people like it. It just feels, doesn't feel very nice. Can you please like it if you are watching it? And if you don't like it, please don't watch it. <laughs> I only want people who like it to watch my stuff. <laughs> Put a lot of time and energy into it. And I would like to be appreciated by you if you can. Please like my page. And also, it, it, it makes it so other people see it. The whole point of this is to care about others and not just about yourself. So far, yeah, we're going to have to have some, I think, some calamities to wake people up so they actually care about others. It hasn't been my experience that many people really do, and it's really sad. So I think we're going to get some big... Mother Earth is going to be shaking us up a little bit to wake us up. Okay, so you place the mother in a private area. Okay, say you were in a large building and you were being quarantined because of the virus for whatever reason or because of some other plague that's coming. Um, that's much, much, much more devastating and more deaths and more, more unrest and everything combined. Well, so there you are. What are you going to do with the mother? Well, you need to find, you need to reassure her. You need to send people to get stuff. Like, okay, we need receptacle. You need a receptacle. You need cloth, clean cloth or, or even t-shirts, anything, a sweater. You know, you need a place for the baby to land, you know, that's soft and absorbent. Even if it's, you know, your, your, your sweatshirt or somebody else, can I have your sweatshirt? Whatever. Um, you get something and then whatever you can do to create privacy. If you have to go into another room, if you can, then do it. If you can't and you have to create some kind of wall with cardboard or something that you can create some kind of wall, do it. If you can't, one of the things I teach at my class is that you, you have just like elephants do, you create a big circle and everybody's got their back to the mother. And in that safe space, you're creating a safe space for that woman. Whatever you have to do to make it safe, and usually that that requires creating a privacy screen of some kind so that she can birth without people watching her. And also trying to keep people quiet. Don't let people get all excited and get all, ah! you know, mm -mm. keep it down. Keep it down. Keep the party down. <laughs> Number three. Okay, we just said that. Place mother and attendant in a quiet, private area. Now, number four, keep mother hydrated and nourished. In our kits, we have a bottle of water and two or three good quality big, you know, food bars. Okay. Now, and then we also have an electrolyte powder that can be mixed into the water. So, um... I recommend also coconut water and electrolyte water for moms because if a mom is losing sweat or if she's been throwing up or if she's exhausted or she's had a long labor, she needs to replace minerals and fluids and energy. So you could, you know, you need to give her something to eat. And the idea that women should just be fasting through their labor. It's just so old school. It's not good. Um, little things like could be grapes, could be, um, could be just, um, small bits of things to give her energy. Do you know what I mean? A little bit of yogurt with some fruit, or it could be even just a spoon of honey at the end. If she just can't seem to keep pushing and she's exhausted, a spoon of honey with a, a chaser of water after, you know, she could, push your baby out on that. So yeah, so have some honey in your kit. Have some molasses with high minerals in your kit because that can be good for, never give a baby honey. Um, but you can give a baby, if you have a baby who has like a cleft lip or the mother for some reason, there's just, or the baby could have like a, um, a sugar imbalance where the baby's like 
got too high sugar and then their sugar goes down too quick and they're not getting enough. You can drop or feed them dilution of um, molasses and, wa and water. And our screen just froze. Okay, we're just going to keep going though. Um, so molasses and water, and I'll try to find the exact um, proportions and put it down below for you, okay? Um, I'm going to keep going. This happened last time. <laughs> I don't know why it happens, but here we go. Do my best. Number five, keep attendance hands clean and keep hands out of the birth canal. So yeah, we don't recommend, there's no reason to go inside for anything really at all, especially during the labor for checking dilation. None of that. Um, it's not sanitary and it's not safe, especially in an out of hospital setting, especially if you don't have a midwife that's trained with you and you're just, you know, helping somebody this way. Now, um, I did mention that what they used to do in the Mexican um, city where my friend was growing up and raised and practiced midwifery there, Kathy O'Brien, she's amazing, from Rigby, Idaho. She um, taught me how they would use, they don the gloves, the kitchen gloves, but they keep that set for the whole birth. And they've got a big bucket either of Lysol water or bleach water. And they're dipping those gloves in there all the time. Dipping, dipping, dipping and drying them off. And then they've got clean gloves to go back. So what they do is they rinse the debris off, you know, under a tap of fresh water. So that the gloves are kind of basically clean. But then they dip them into that mixture to sterilize them for the next, um, not the next person really, but the next you know, part of the birth, and then they would dry them out for the next birth and sterilize them that way. Um, yeah, so that's number five, is to keep your hands clean and keep them out of the birth canal. Number six, so, you know, you could have hand sanitizer, some kind of soap and water in your kit that you would could wash your hands with somehow. Let mother, number six, let mother push at her own pace you know you see all that counting and different you know oh you have to be 10 centimeters before you can push there's no research to support that whatsoever so all the old school people who know who think they know that um, I think not letting the mother push or, or just like not having her not suggesting that she push not asking her if she feels like she needs to push just let it be fully organic. And if she's not sure, just breathe until she can't help pushing. When she can't help pushing, that's going to be probably when it's okay to push, you know. And it really is. I have seen this. It is really true that if you leave it and you don't push it, the mother will organically start pushing when the baby's head is low enough to trigger the reflex and it's literally the body is pushing not the mother i mean the mother's helping but really the body reflexively ejects the baby <laughs> and so that is what happens when um when you leave it alone and you let the natural um head descent so the head's descending into the pelvis during the labor um, important to use upright mobility during labor and um, you can use running start is a really good position too. You can do a, a running start position. You can look online to see what that looks like if you don't know, but it's basically one foot forward and the knee down and you can even rock back and forth in that position is really helpful. Now we're going to go to number um, six. Let mother push at her own pace and avoid pulling on the baby's head. Yes, always avoid pulling on the baby's head or twisting or anything. It doesn't help at all and it hurts the baby. Um, we also have a little asterisk at the bottom. It says items needed. <laughs> Ziploc bag for placenta to be carried in, a baby blanket and a towel. That's all we have as the basic supplies on this little kit just because that's kind of the bottom line. You need something to put the placenta in because you're not going to cut the cord because cutting the cord is dangerous in the low resource setting. 
unless you have sterilized equipment and have people there that are really trained and know how to let the cord pulse on its own until it's fully, fully, completely finished. Because that baby needs that blood for its brain development and its body and its lungs to, to fully expand. Okay, it creates more pressure. When you have more, more um, blood in there, it's really important. Now, number seven. Again, it says, invite the divine assistance of angels to guide you. And I reiterate that. I can't stress enough to be open to that um, and ask for help. At the birth, number seven, at the birth, check baby for breathing. So just check and make sure the baby's breathing. If needed, gently turn baby down to drain fluids. So I've showed this in other show, in other um, teachings where you... You literally hold the baby on your arm with the baby's head in your hand, with their face in your hand. You know, you're, you're kind of holding your fingers around their chin and jaw. So you're supporting their neck and their head. And you're rubbing their back from the base of the spine to the neck with them in a drainage position. It's called postural drainage position. We teach that in our classes. And then you can actually wipe the baby's nose and mouth off. But we don't have that on the claw, on this because this is just super simple. Number eight, place baby skin to skin with mother for warmth. Dry baby gently, warm and dry. Yes, keep the baby warm and dry. Babies are very susceptible to temperature irregulation. So keep the baby and the mother dry. Keep them skin to skin and have something warm and dry on the outside of the baby. Um, number 10, help mother establish breastfeeding. It is necessary in the low resource setting. And like in Katrina, there was a baby in Katrina that died. Her mother, hey, you're back. Woo! <laughs> um, there was a baby in Katrina whose mother came into the, this huge arena. Okay. After the Katrina thing. And she had her three month old baby with her, but she didn't have any milk left because she wasn't bre she was breastfeeding but then she had weaned the baby about like a month or two before and so she didn't have any bottle food for that like they didn't have any formula and do you know what no one knew to tell this mother that she could relactate remember you can relactate so if a mother has weaned a child and there's no food just get that baby to start sucking and she will start producing milk again. That baby died. That baby died in Katrina because of the foolishness of the people. Nobody knew to tell the mother she could nurse the baby. Nursing is vital. It's, it's critical. In low resource settings, or in, especially in post-disaster settings, civil unrest, pandemics that are actually really serious in other places. Um, this is happening even right now. But when this happens, it is critical that the mothers and the babies have um, the idea that breastfeeding is, is essential, it's literally. And there's very few people that actually can't breastfeed. Um, the truth is that there's almost no one that can't breastfeed, but it's more our culture that makes it so people can't breastfeed because if they're not watching people breastfeed it's hard for them to learn how to breastfeed it really is so it just creates restrictions in the brain i think about the whole idea of it so yeah so i think we need to breastfeed in public and um, <laughs> start breastfeeding in churches <laughs> breastfeeding everywhere so that People aren't like thinking the bottles are the way to go they're unsanitary babies die in those settings uh, they really do. They, according to Robin Lim's research um, and her experience over in these third world countries and mine too, um, they they have to breastfeed or they don't survive. Okay. Hey, we got our picture back. <laughs> I don't know why this keeps happening. It's almost like it happens when there's things I'm saying that are really important. So there's a spiritual element to everything that happens here. I know that. I hope you enjoy um, learning. I'm almost done the list. Um, we have um, 
only three more items and then I'm going to take you and show you some plantain I think before we stop um, help mother establish breastfeeding it is necessary yes keep mother and baby together constantly they should never be separated period period <laughs> um, keep records I, I guess there could be one exception is if the placenta is already born and the mother's already breastfed and it's been hours after the birth and she wants to get up and have a shower or something and the father does the skin to skin that's what we do we'll have the father do skin to skin fathers can do skin to skin and it's really nice it's good for the daddy it's good for the babies we did it at a lot of our births and they really liked it the men really like it too it's very bonding for the babies to bond with their fathers they know their dads that's one thing I know. If the fathers have been part of their pregnancy, they know the father's voices and they really like them. I often will have the fathers talk to the babies if the babies are having a hard time breathing and, then, and it almost instantly gets them breathing again. So don't underestimate the, the power of, you know, the more subtle things. Um, okay, so number 11. Keep mother and baby together constantly. Number 12, keep records of basic birth info, time, date, and names. Yeah, you know, you could just write down a few basic things after. And But here's the thing. What what we're trying to say, what, what the reason why we put this on here is because if you were in a big uh, building, say you were in a, uh, let's say something a little nicer than a Walmart. Let's talk about maybe a, a large church building. And you're all in the gym, say, and um, there's like, there, I mean, who knows? It could be like more than one person having babies in there, right? So what we recommended was with masking tape when applicable, that means if there's lots of people and you don't want to get babies mixed up, you um, identify the mother and the baby with the date, time, and name. And that's it. That's all I have. So uh, a lot of the women will keep masking tape and a uh, pen um, in their kits as well. The women that um, have been taking my courses. Um, and so, okay, you want to go see it? Want to go see the plantain? All right, let's do it then. This is going to be a little long, but whatever. It is what it is. <laughs> okay, David's making food. And I'm going out to show you the plantain. Well, I can show you the stuff that's dried because I did do a big harvest. I did a big harvest here. I'm just going to show you how they look as they're almost dry. Okay. You see? That's what they look. But I'm going to show you outside how they look. And these are the... The prickly lettuce. See that? It looks like the leaf has this similar shape, and then the seeds, I'm collecting the seeds as well. The leaf has a similar shape to um, to a dandelion, but it's totally different. Like, I mean, these things are like four feet tall. And this is how it looks dried. They're kind of prickly. Those are the prickly wild lettuce. Okay, now we're gonna go to the front door. And we have a little cricket. Little cricket. <laughs> gonna walk over here. And we'll just take a little walk. <laughs> and I will show you my plantain. This is my side yard show you my stone. I have a three ton amethyst stone that we brought with us. And it's in the shape of a heart. I love to come lay on it and sit on it and stuff. Anyway, I'm going to show you. It's right here. That's the stone. Anyway, okay. Now we're going to go. We're gonna, I'm going to show you these beautiful plantain plants. They're just lovely. And then I'm going to say goodbye to you. I hope you have a super good day. I'm happy you joined me today. Okay. Right over here by the raspberry patch. 
I didn't even know this pump was here. It's, it's over by the shop. And it's just uh, lovely, beautiful. It's, it's got a big, huge mullein plant beside it I can show you too. beautiful um, large leaf for a for a um, plantain. This is a pretty good size. And there's a bunch of them. A bunch of plants everywhere. Anyway, I hope you have a really good day. And um, bless you and I hope you enjoy this information. Let me know so that I can know what you want. And if there's other things you want to learn um, that aren't things I've been teaching you, then let me know. I'm just trying to, can't really see my, I can't see, oh, there it is, my mouse. All right. Bless you all and have a really good day. Take care. Bye-bye.